Okay, so uh, we're here to talk about lesson three. I have uh, a number of slides that I'd like to talk through, and then I also have some exercises that we can uh, walk through together. And um, so without further ado, let me get started. So a big part of lesson three is the topic of cursors. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get out of this particular uh, way of showing the slides. Um, can everybody see my slides? Okay. Yep, it's full screen now. Okay. All right, so uh, the, the main topic of this lesson is uh, cursors. And cursors uh, is kind of an unusual term. We usually think of the, the thing on the screen, right, that blinks at you. But um, in this context, a cursor is used to manage a, a subset of tabular data. And there's three types of cursors that we can work with in uh, ArcGIS. The search cursor, which is used really just to work with existing tabular data and not make any changes to the to the data. Then there's also the insert type which we can use to add new data, add new records to a table. And there's the update cursor which we can use to modify records that are already in the data. So we're going to focus mostly in this uh, lecture here on search cursors. We'll talk about the other two as well. There's actually uh, a few different alternatives, a few different search cursor classes built into ArcPy. And uh, the one we're gonna focus on here exclusively in this lecture, and you can read more about the other types in the lesson. But in this lecture, we're gonna talk about the one that was introduced at ArcGIS 10.1 through the data access module uh, or So we get to that through the ArcPy.da uh, module. And so uh, that function is what we recommend. Uh, it offers the best uh, performance functionality uh, versus the other ones. You can find an older version of the search cursor function through the main ArcPy module. So you would do ArcPy dot, dot search cursor. You would need to use this if you have uh, ArcGIS pre 10.1. I'm guessing that no one does, but uh, if you did, that's what you'd have to use. But uh, it still might be worth, you know, having a look at how that version of the search cursor works because you may cr come across some code that was built in those days and it's gonna be important for you to understand how that works. So here is uh, an example that uses the one that we recommend, the one that's accessed through the data access module. And uh, so this example here uh, finds the state capitals in a city's data set. Uh, it starts out by uh, setting up a reference to the USA file geodatabase that you guys were given, I think, as part of lesson three. And there's a cities feature class in there, which contains a field called capital that holds a Y or an N if that uh, city is a state capital. Name, obviously, stores the name. And then state ABB stores the abbreviation of the state that the city is found in. And as I recall, that, that uh, abbreviation takes the form US-PA or US-NY, et cetera. So uh, this example here, the, uh, the first argument to the search cursor class is the feature class that you want to work with that has the tabular data that you want to work with. And I should point out that you're not limited to feature classes uh, using search cursors. You could also use search cursors on uh, plain tables, uh, standalone tables that don't have geometry in them. But in any case, uh, the next argument you supply is going to be the fields that you're interested in uh, dealing with. And when you supply the fields, you do so using some sort of iterable. And I don't know if I remember, if, if I used that term in a previous lecture or how much it was used in the lessons. But an iterable is really just 
uh, any sort of data type that you can iterate through. And so lists are probably the first thing you think of. But uh, the other main type that you might work with here would be a tuple. And a tuple is really the same thing as a list, except you're not allowed to change the items in a tuple after you've defined it. And uh, you probably recall that you define a list using square brackets around the items. A tuple, you have a, a similar uh, set of items separated by commas, but you instead use parentheses rather than square brackets. So uh, I've got three fields that I'm interested in working with in my search cursor here. And I close the parentheses on the, the arguments to the search cursor class. And I follow it up with an as clause where I basically uh, define a variable that I want to store this, this search cursor in. And in a lot of examples, you're gonna see that that variable is called just simply cursor, but you're not limited to that. If you wanted to give it a more specific name, uh, you could, you could call it city's cursor. You could call it uh, the search cursor, whatever you want to. Um, so you follow that up with a colon and then the code that uh, handles or you know works with the search cursor is gonna be indented. And then typically what you'll see is a for loop. And you can really think of the cursor as being a lot like a list uh, in that you can iterate through the items found in that object, in that cursor. So you're gonna do for something in, and then that variable that you plug in after the word in needs to match what you call the variable on the with line, the with statement. And then this variable here, uh, after the word for, Again, you have control over that. Typically, you'll see it called row, uh, but I could easily see it called record or uh, city row or something to that effect. And then within that loop, you would then uh, make use of the object stored in the row variable. And you can get at the uh, values in the fields that you said you wanted to work with. Uh, by supplying a digit inside the square brackets. So you, could, you would say row, and then inside square brackets, you'd put zero if you wanted to work with the first field, or one if you wanted to work with the second field, et cetera. Okay, so uh, you know, what this code here does is it gets the value held in the capital field, that YN field. Uh, and actually, I think I said it holds a Y or an N. It looks like it holds a one or a zero. So I'm sorry about that. So uh, what it does is it checks to see, is that value a one? If so, then we're dealing with a, a state capital. And uh, you know this, this script is pretty simple. It, it just uh, spits out the names of the capital cities as it encounters them. So if it is a capital city, then, then it says, uh, okay, let's get the name value as well and the state value. And let's uh, print those, print, print the name and then say, is the capital of and then uh, this block of code here, um, this is where I'm gonna ask people to uh, chime in. Um, can anybody explain what's going on there with state val and then uh, minus two colon inside the square brackets? Anybody remember what that syntax does? Doesn't it do the second to last all the way through to the end? Yeah, very good. Um, exactly. It says start two characters from the end of the string. And the lack of anything after the colon basically says, give me everything beyond that. All the characters past that. And yeah, so if the state abbreviation column, as I said, was US-PA and you wanted the PA part only, then this is used to get that that slice of the string. Okay, so that actually ta takes us to um, the first little exercise that I wanted to walk through together. Uh, the data for this is the USA file geodata geo database that we just saw on the previous slide, which is on page one, uh, 3.1 of lesson three. And we're gonna work with the, the borders field in the states feature class. And the, uh, what we want to do in this exercise is write a script 
that prints the name of the smallest state that borders six or more other states. And so what I've got here is just an example from the previous slide that you can refer to uh, as, you, as, you, as we go through this. So I'll open up Python Win, uh, open a new Python script. And this is definitely something that involves using ArcPy. So we'll start with import ArcPy. And uh, then we need to have uh, a reference to that state's feature class. As I, as I said, that's the feature class we want to work with here. So um, I'm actually going to open ArcMap here. Because rather than type out this long path, and I have to update my license in about 13 days. Rather than type out the full path to the data, which at this point I probably could have never done. But uh, I'm going to navigate to it in the, the catalog window. And here is my USA file geo, geo database. And I'll go inside there find states, and uh, you know, I might as well show you the attribute table if you don't have it open already. And here's that borders column, which uh, stores how many states are bordering uh, each of the states. So, um, you know, with this, the feature class highlighted there, if I go up into the location toolbar up here and click, you'll see that it expands to the, the complete path to the data and, and uh, selects that path. So I can just hit control C on my keyboard to copy that to my clipboard. And then come back to my script and put this inside quotes. And uh, is there anything else I ought to do when I copy and paste in that way? Anybody? You have to put R at the beginning of it. Yeah, very good. So yeah, this is uh, potentially problematic because of the use of forward slashes, single forward slashes. Remember that I can use uh, double forward slashes, or I can use backslashes, single backslashes, or I can use single forward slashes, but I need to put uh, this lowercase r here. Uh, and I forget exactly what that stands with you, but I do know that the forward slashes, certain forward slash character combinations means something special. It's called an escape uh, sequence uh, to insert certain kinds of special characters in there. Uh, and that's not something we want to do here, such as a, a line break or, or a new paragraph, things like that. And that's not something we want to do here. So I put the lowercase. Okay, so uh, I'm going to want to uh, set up my search cursor here. Archpy.da.search cursor. Uh, plug in my feature class that I defined above. And then I supply a tuple of fields. And it could be a list too, but because I'm not going to want to change this at all. And I want the state name. I want the shape area is remember the scenario here is we want the state that uh, of the states that border six or more other states we want to find the smallest one of those so we want to look at the area and then the borders column of course so then i close the parentheses to close that tuple and then i close the parentheses around the uh, search cursor arguments and I'm just going to call this state's cursor just to be just to drive home the point that you, we can call this whatever we want to. We're not limited to calling it cursor. And uh, now I'll do four row in state's cursor. And let's get the name out of the out of column zero. And I'm just going to print that. So what you know, what I'm doing here is something that I I try to drive home to any student that takes a class with me in programming. 
That is to take baby steps towards the ultimate solution. Uh, don't try to bang out the whole script in one fell swoop. You know, go uh, short steps at a time. And so I'm just going to see if I can get this to work. So let me save. Lesson three. I'm going to create a demo folder here. And I'll call this. Uh, no, not, not that. Order states dot pi. All right, so I'll check the syntax. Syntax is good. So I'll hit the, uh, and the other thing that I drive home to folks is uh, the use of F10 to step through your code. Don't just hit the run button, get an error, and then you know, not have any idea where the problem is. Use F10 to one line at a time and uh, initially setting up the search cursor takes a few seconds so that's why we're waiting here I'm going to get rid of these watch variable watch window variables since they don't apply to this one Okay, so that it does seem to be working. So I'll just go ahead and hit the, the run button to run through the rest of it. Okay, so that's a good, that's a good start. Now, uh, I want to look at the borders column, right? So I'll create a variable called borders val, the column two, field two. And I want to do if borders val is greater than or equal to six, Do, uh, let me do that same sort of thing. I'll just print out the name of the state. So I'll go ahead and run that. And yeah, that's a much smaller subset, so that's good. I seem to be on the right track. Now, I'll, I'm also going to want the area. That's in position one of the tuple. And at this point, you need to have some sort of logic to you know, keep track of which one has the smallest area. And so the way I would approach that is before the setup of the search cursor, I would create a variable to hold the smallest area. And now coming back to the feature class, to the attribute table, here's the shape area column. And these areas are actually in square decimal degrees, which is not something you really ought to use in a real life situation because decimal degrees are not a uniform measure of distance. Uh, the distance changes depending on what latitude you're at. But, uh, we're going to go ahead and use it. And what I've done here is I've set up a variable that's going to set up the variable, the smallest area of variable, to hold some large number that I know is bigger than the biggest area in that table. And that way, when I do encounter one of these states that has more than six, or six or more ordering states, I know that that state will become the new smallest area state. Um, I'm almost also going to set up a variable to store the name of that state. And I'm going to set that to an empty string. Initialize it to an empty string before we start iterating through the states in the cursor. All right. So I've got the area value in the area val variable. So what I can do is say if area val less than smallest area, And what do you think I'm going to do? Add a print statement? Well, I could. 
I could. Ultimately, what we want to do is print the name of one state, which we've determined to be the smallest state of those uh, six or more border state states. Um, and so at this point in the loop, I just want to, I, I don't want to do a print statement here within the loop. I want to wait until the loop is over and I've found the smallest state. So what else might I try to do here to keep track of which one's the smallest? Any ideas? Well, what I'll do is say that the smallest state, I'm going to reset that variable to be set it equal to name val. And the smallest area, likewise, will become the area of the current state, whatever state we happen to be working on in this iteration through the loop. Okay, so we're gonna cycle through all the states and each time we encounter one of these, one of the states that has six or more border states, then we're gonna jump down, you know, gonna enter into this area here. And then we'll get the area of that state and we'll check it against smallest area. And if it's smaller than all the other states that have been encountered so far with six or more border states, then we will reset what the smallest area is and the name of the smallest state. And after the loop is all done, we should have found the correct state. And so I would add the print statement, smallest state, ordering six plus other states is and I'll plug in my smallest state variable period the area is okay now that print statement does anybody see a problem with it see a syntax problem? You'll need to put smallest area as an integer? Yeah, I, I want to, well, a it, as a string, right? It's, uh, it's already a number, and I try to concatenate it as a number with uh, the string parameter. It's going to give me a problem, so I just need to use a string function on it, like, like so. Okay, so I'll check the syntax. Syntax is good. So I'm going to start stepping through here again. And let me put name val up here. And orders val. All right, so the first state in the cursor is Alabama has a border of a number of bordering states of four. So this expression here will evaluate to false, which means none of this code inside is going to get executed. It means it's going to jump back to the top of the loop. And that's what we see happening. Now I'm on Alaska, which has zero. Again, we'll come back to the top of the loop. Arizona has five. Arkansas has six. So now at this point, that expression will evaluate to true. So I will do the stuff that's inside that if block. Um, and so I get the area, I check the area against the smallest area variable. And, and again, that smallest area variable, I initialize to something really big, such that it's gonna be greater than all of these Arkansas happens to be actually 13 and a half, roughly. So that's going to 
become the new smallest area. Okay, and then I would continue through. There's California, Colorado, Colorado's area, less than Arkansas's. No, I don't think it is. So it jumps back to the top of the loop. It doesn't do this bit of logic. All right, so you get the idea. And uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit run to go through the rest. And the, the, I did this same demo with students in a face-to-face -face class, undergrads, and they pointed out to me that they were getting uh, Rhode Island instead of Virginia. And Rhode Island is certainly smaller. Um, let me see. My Rhode Island record only says two bordering states. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you now. It cut out for a little while. Okay, I'm sorry about that. My internet connection is spotty. Okay, um, so basically uh, what I just did was I finished running through the script and got an answer. So that's one way that you could uh, use a search cursor to solve a problem like that. Um, anybody have a question, any questions about that example we just walked through? Could you uh, reshare your screen? It looks like when you cut out it, uh, close down the screen sharing. Oh yeah, will do. There we go. Okay, and I just opened the chat box too. So if anybody's wanting to t uh, type something through the chat box, you can feel free to do that as well. Okay, so uh, let me get back to slides here. All right, so that was kind of a really basic use of the search cursor. There's, there's some options to it that we can make, uh, take advantage of. Both the search cursor function that we recommend that you use through the data access module and the older ones have something called a where clause parameter. And that refers to uh, SQL, structured query language, which I bet a lot of you have uh, used in your work, in which uh, statements are, are made up of clauses. And so a fairly basic SQL statement, select statement. Uh, here's an example, select name, state abbreviation from cities where capital equals one. So that first line we would refer to as the select clause in that statement. The second one will be the, the from clause. And then the last one would be the where clause, which is what we're talking about here with uh, search cursors. And that, that clause basically limits the records that get returned uh, to you from the overall data set, from the overall table. And so here's an example. Uh, same scenario, or same, um, well, same cities feature class that we saw a couple of slides ago. Um, and instead of just getting all of the records found in, in that feature class, we're applying a where clause saying that the capital field has to hold a value of one. Okay. Now, the lesson I think shows that the field, shows the field name being put in quotes, but you should know that that's not necessary if you're dealing with file-based data formats such as shapefiles and file geodatabases. So when that's the case, you don't have to put the field inside quotes, which is nice because this expression, the where clause expression as a whole, has to be in quotes because uh, ArcPy expects that you're going to put it in string in there, an expression as a string. But then if the field has to be quoted, then you're got, you've got quotes inside quotes, which, get, which gets a little tricky. Uh, but when you're dealing with file-based data formats, you don't have to do that. Some other search cursor options. Um, Actually, before we 
before we touch on these, let's make use of the where clause option in our example. So uh, what could we do? How could we take advantage of that where clause option in this scenario? Anybody? Could it be used instead of the if statement for the border value? So saying where the border value is greater than or less than or greater than and equal to six? Yeah, exactly. So rather than having that, this logic here inside the loop, we could instead do that same sort of expression as a where clause. So I'm going to copy that and Here. And so you're going to add this argument to the list of arguments after the, the field list or field couple, however you define it. And it's not actually going to be borders. It's going to be referring to the field name itself. Borders. And then greater than or equal to six. And if we do that, then we no longer need this logic added because now we know that all of the rows in the cursor are going to meet that criterion. So all we need to do is check the areas, right? So I'll just get rid of that if block. Save that. Again, and I get the same answer, which is a good sign. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a nice feature to be able to uh, take advantage of when you're dealing with cursors. So other search cursor options. You can also get at the geometry information if you're dealing with a feature class. And you do that by in that field list or tuple, you would insert what's referred to as a token, a geometry token, shape token. So for example, if you just wanted the X coordinate value, then you would use the token shape at X in all caps. You can do the same for the Y coordinate. If you want them both, you would do shape at XY. Or if you want the area, you could do shape at area. And so here's an example uh, where I'm asking for a name field, a, a, a column that, that stores the name, a column that stores the state, and then I'm also asking for the uh, XY coordinate. Here. Now, um, you should note here that it's going to give you the, the coordinates. If it's a point, well, that's pretty simple. You know, it's got an X, Y coordinate. Um, if it's a, a line or a polygon, however, it's going to give you the centroid of that uh, line or polygon. And the other thing is the coordinates are going to be returned to you as a tuple. So you would have to, you know, make use of them deal with that tuple appropriately in your code. Okay, and then uh, my next point there is that you can also add in or make use of some other uh, SQL features, but only on uh, if you're dealing with enterprise geodatabase feature classes or file geodatabase feature classes, you can't use these features with shapefile data. Uh, the first one is you can have a, what's referred to as a prefix clause that includes the word distinct. So you would use that keyword in a SQL statement if the, the query or you know, the data that you're getting back included duplicates. 
would want those duplicates. So you would use the distinct keyword to basically eliminate all duplicates from the data. You could also include what's referred to as a postfix clause. And the main um, reason you might want to use one of these, I think, is that you can order the data. Two examples here. The first one shows using that distinct keyword. So I've got um, setting up the search cursor just like in the previous examples with a feature class. Here I'm using a list of fields in which I just have one field in that list. Now the supplying these uh, clauses, these prefix and postfix clauses, you actually have to skip over a few other parameters, and I should show you that. So let me escape out of my presentation here. I'll go to the help system. And I'm going to look up search cursor. Spell it right. And you can see here's the, the older version. This is the one I want though, the arcpy.da. If I go to the syntax section, you can see that um, there's the input table, the field names, the where clause. Those are things that we've seen already. Notice uh, the where clause is inside curly braces, which indicates that it's an optional thing. Um, but then there's a spatial reference parameter an explode to points parameter, and then the SQL clause. What we were just talking about. And if I scroll down, you, know, you can read what the explode to points means. And here's, there's, there's some uh, discussion of these prefix and postfix clauses that, that I just talked about. Okay, so in order to get to set that SQL clause parameter, I need to skip over at least these two parameters. All right, so back to the slides. Okay, so in this case, I, I omitted a where clause. Uh, I, I omitted the spatial reference parameter and the explode. Um, so notice in this case that that, that SQL clause par parameter, if I wanted to just set, set a prefix clause, I need to you know, I put in what I want there, comma, and then just an empty postfix clause. And those two items are defined using a tuple. This uh, example, on the other hand, I wanted to set the postfix clause. So I used an empty string for the prefix clause, comma, and then I put in my postfix clause. So in this case, uh, I'm saying that I wanted my uh, search cursor rows to be ordered by state abbreviation. Now, by default, the ordering is going to be in ascending order. So from A to Z, or from one to, you know, starting at one to 100 or whatever. If I wanted to go the other direction, uh, I would add after the field name, I would put, whoops, I would put uh, space DESC for, for Ascending is the uh, default, though. Okay. So uh, before we go on to spatial queries, I want to go back to the one we've been working on again, because we can make use of some of the features we just talked about. Uh, namely, we can make use of the order by. And what I'm going to propose we do, well, does anybody have any idea how we could take advantage of the order by clause in this scenario? Could you maybe order by the shape area to begin with? 
So even though it's not going to, it'll, the borders will have to do something as well. You're still working in ascending size. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, you can, you can order by the area. And if you do that, then you know that, well, if at the same time you've applied the borders criteria as, as a where clause, then you know that the first row in the cursor is going to be the, the one that has the smallest area. And so that's what I want to take advantage of here. So I'm going to come in here and uh, I've, I've saved the new copy of this um, script. And I'm going to skip over the Uh, those two parameters that I'm not interested in. And remember that I have to supply, even though the thing that I want to add here is a postfix clause, I also have to supply an empty prefix clause. Those two things together need to be supplied as a tuple. So I put a set of empty parentheses here. So there's my prefix clause. And now comes my postfix clause, which is going to order by Could do that if I wanted to, but that is the default to begin with. So I can omit that. Okay, now um, before I go on, there was there was something that popped into my head that I thought was important to mention to you guys in case you haven't already come across it. The fact that I had to skip over these parameters, it's kind of annoying. Um, is anyone aware of another way to supply the parameters for a tool uh, or a uh, function in this case? Anybody know what I'm getting at there? When you look at the syntax for a tool or a function like this, each of the parameters has a name. First one here is in underscore table. The next one's field underscore names, et cetera. So an alternative way of supplying these parameters would be to say in underscore table equals field underscore names equals. And if you supply your parameters that way, all of your parameters named, then you don't have to skip over parameters and you can put the parameters in whatever order you want. So that's another way to, to specify your parameters. And one reason I really like to point this out to folks is that another uh, thing that you should remember is that you can run any tool in our toolbox and then go to the geoprocessing results window. And my R crap is slow to respond there. Um, go to the results window and I haven't run any in my current session, but if I did have any tools that I had run, I could right click on the tool, I think, and say uh, copy as Python snippet. And it, it, it'll take that running of the tool and, and turn it into a, a Python snippet, as it says. And I could then paste that into my Python win window so that I could uh, you know, make use of that, that snippet. And the reason I bring this up is Python snippets created in that way have the parameters supplied using the, the parameter names the way we just talked about. So I didn't want you to be thrown off seeing the parameters supplied in that way. If you have to go to the Python snippet option that I just described. Okay, getting back to the script. If I add this order by clause, I can change my, change my uh, logic inside here quite a bit. I no longer have to iterate through all of the rows in the cursor, really. I can just get the first row out of the cursor. And I can do that because, uh, using a method called next. Okay, so that'll give me the first row in the cursor. I don't need any of this looping. Uh, I don't need the looping code anymore. 
I'm still going to want to get the name. And I'll get the area value as well. And then my print statement. I'm not keeping track of the smallest one anymore. I would just plug in my name val there. And my area val. So let me run this. And actually, I don't need this anymore, right? And I also don't need orders in my field names. So let me test that out. Okay, so I, I still am getting the correct answer. Uh, any questions about that? So there's a lot of handy options that search cursors have, and uh, we just saw uh, saw a few of them. So let me get back now to the slides and we'll talk about spatial queries. So um, some database package packages have spatial functions built into them such that you know you can do spatial uh, you know looking at spatial relationships between layers and things like that in your SQL statements uh, using where clauses, for example, within where clauses. But that's not something you, you can really do in ArcGIS. What you have to do instead, if you want to do a, a spatial query type of thing, is use a tool called select layer by location. And here's the basic syntax. Uh, you supply an input layer, an overlap type, And then a uh, set of features that you want to use to select against the input. And both the input layer and the select features parameters need to be what are referred to as feature layer objects. They can't just be feature classes. It can't just be a reference to a shape file or to a, a feature class in a geo database. It's got to be something that they call a feature layer. So let's talk about how you get one of those. There is a tool called Make Feature Layer. And it takes a set of input features, and that's where you're going to plug in a feature class. Then you're going to give the second parameter is going to be the name that you want to give to this feature layer. And then lastly, there's a third parameter, which is an optional where clause. That's a, you know, again, that's an expression that's going to limit the features that you're going to stick into this feature layer from the original feature class. So here's an example. Uh, I've got a shape file called US Boundaries. Um, I store the, uh, the name of that shape file in a variable. I have a, and inside that, uh, that shape file attribute table, there's a field called state ABB. It's got that US dash. Uh, naming convention used. And so I've, I've, I'm going to create a variable to hold the state that I'm interested in. And then here's this, the make feature layer uh, tool statement. I plug in the, the feature class. I'm going to use a where clause that says, basically, I only want uh, Pennsylvania. And then I'm giving a name to this feature layer of selected state. And here's a, taking that same little snippet and, and showing it in a larger context. 
So what this example does is it prints the names of all the cities within a specific. And so building on what we just saw, uh, here's states FC, which was in the previous slide. I'm also creating a cities FC variable that holds a, a city shape file. And I'm gonna create a feature layer from the cities feature class. And I'm gonna call that feature layer cities layer. And then likewise, I'll create one from the states feature class, which is what we just saw. I called that feature layer selected state. And then I can do select layer by location. Because like I said, it wants the input layer parameter and the select features parameter to be feature layers. So I've created the two feature layers. Now I can do select layer by location. And I'm saying, give me all this, the cities that are contained by the selected state, contained by Pennsylvania, basically. Now, cities layer and selected state, those are just objects in memory whose lifetime is the lifetime of that Python win session. Close Python win, those objects get destroyed. Um, but as you can see here, you know, I, I created those named objects and then I make, then I can refer to those objects by their names later on in my code. Okay, so it's a, it's a bit of an odd thing. A lot of folks tend to think of, like sometimes people will put a .shp inside this name. And that doesn't really make sense because you're not creating a data set on disk. You ju you're just creating an object in memory only. Uh, so you just give it a name that makes sense for your scenario. Okay, so uh, you know, picking up on, on that uh, code we were just looking at, let me go back again. So I, I created the feature layers, I ran select layer by location. After running that, this feature layer is going to have a selection applied to it. It's going to have a subset of its larger uh, set of features selected. And now I can work with that selection. And I do that using a search cursor. So I, I, I run a search cursor over that feature layer. So the previous examples we saw, we, were, we plugged in a feature class here. But you can also plug in one of these feature layer here, and then it operates the same as if I was uh, working on a feature class. I, I supply what features or fields I'm interested in, and then I can iterate through it using a for loop. You'll notice here that um, I supplied a tuple of field names with just a single field name, but I followed that up with a comma, and you're, you're going to need to do that in certain contexts. Sometimes you can get away with not, if you only have one field that you're interested in, sometimes you can get away with just having the field by itself. But there's other times you have to have a comma after it. And I don't, I, I can't pretend to know why that's the case. Um, but it's always a good idea to have that comma there. That you'll, you'll never go wrong doing that. Again, if you're only dealing with one field. If you, want, if you had two fields that you needed to use in your cursor, you could have those two fields and you wouldn't have to have a comma after the second field. Okay. Something to note here that's a, a good idea is to delete using the delete tool, the feature layers after you're done with them. And that basically frees up uh, the locks that those feature layers might have on their underlying data sets. So that takes me to uh, another exercise that I wanted to do with you, which is um, to use the hydro and cities feature classes in that same USA geo database and write a script that prints the names of cities that are five miles or less from the Mississippi. So I'm going to jump back to Python win. Create a new script. We need our pi, so we start with that. And I'm going to set up references to my two feature classes.
and I'm going to set my workspace. And let me come back here again and copy this path, location toolbar, and catalog. And by setting the workspace in that way, I'll be able to refer to my teacher classes just by their names. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to plug in the path to the cities and the path to the hydrant, you know, redundantly. I don't have to do that. Okay, so now I want to create, ultimately, I want to do a select layer by the saw that requires feature layers. So I need to do that make feature layer step. And I want to do it, uh, create a feature layer of the cities. We'll call that cities layer. Remember that this feature layer, this make feature layer tool has an optional where clause parameter. I don't want a subset of the cities. I, I want to um, have all of them. So I'll, I'll omit the where clause. And now for the hydro, create a feature layer called hydro layer. But getting back to the scenario, uh, let me bring in the hydro data, the city's data. I'm gonna open up the hydro table. And remember the scenario is we wanna find cities that are within five miles of the Mississippi River. So if I look at the hydro attribute table, I have a column called name N, which stands for name in English. You can see it's also in French and Spanish. So I want to query that name N column, right? And I want to look for Mississippi River in there. All right, so I'll come back to my script and add a where clause here. Name N equals Okay, so I've, I, it's just like writing an um, attribute query through the GUI. When you are querying a string field, you have to put the value that you're looking for inside quotes, right? So I've done that here as well. So my hydro layer, feature layer, should refer to just the Mississippi River, Mississippi River and filter out all the other rivers. Now I can do select layer by location. And you can see the parameters that it has there in uh, underneath in that box. So what am I gonna put first? It's gonna be my input layer. I want to select cities that are within five miles of the Mississippi River. Would it be hydro layer? Uh, actually, no. We're going to put cities layer first. Cities layer is the layer that we want to select features in. So that comes first. Then we want to have a overlap type. And if I go to the select layer by location tool, help. 
go down to the syntax section, you'll see that there's a whole list of the spatial relationships that I can take advantage of. And uh, anybody see the one that I would want in this case? You'd want within a distance, I think you said. Right. Now, there's a couple other variants on that within a distance 3D and within a distance geodesic. Um, the, the geodesic would make sense if you take the Earth's curvature into account. Um, we, we won't bother with that in this case. Five miles from the Mississippi River, we should be okay with just plain um, two, uh, 2D. Distances. So um, plug that in. Then we'll put in our hydro layer. That's the thing that's going to be used to select the features in the input layer. And I haven't plugged in the five mile part yet, right? So if I come back to the help, look at the uh, parameters for the tool. After select features, there's an optional parameter called search distance. So if I continue going down the page, it tells me that this is a parameter that's valid when the overlap type parameter is set to one of the following, within a distance, geodesic, within a um, all the within a distance options, intersect, and a few others. Um, and if I scroll down, I wonder if there's an example that shows using that. I don't think there is. So um, this is actually a case where the, the documentation doesn't, doesn't do a great job of explaining how you would do this particular sort of query. Um, but what you would do is in that search distance parameter, yeah, search distance, you would actually plug in as a string five miles, or you could do you know kilometers, whatever the whatever the unit happens to be. Okay, so as I said before, what that'll do is that'll create a selection on this feature. Search cursor. So instead of plugging in a feature class here as we did before, I will plug in the feature layer that I created a selection on in the previous statement. And I'm going to want the name. Field names tuple. And I'll call this cities cursor. And I will loop through it using a for loop. And I'm just going to print the names of these cities. So I'll do print row zero the name of the city. Then a comma. And before I add anything else, let me get the state abbreviation. So I'm going to create a variable called state. Like that. Then I can use that syntax we saw earlier to chop off the US dash part. So I need to save this. Call it cities near this river. Hi. Okay. 
Okay, and I can run that. Takes a few seconds, but I do get the list of cities that, and that it, it makes sense. It's a logical one. Okay. Is there a reason you specified the state negative two? Because isn't the abbreviation typically going to be two letters anyway? Um, we look at the city's attribute table, see how it's got the US dash. Got it. And I just wanted the last two characters, so. And there's something in the chat box. I'm sorry, Danny, if you were answering questions earlier, I, <laughs> I lost my chat box there. So um, looks like you had the right answers there. Um, Now, one thing that I could do if, you know, let's, let's say I wanted someone else to be able to use this script maybe on a different river um, or I wanted to use it on a different river. Well, where, where that change would be required is, is here right now, right? And it takes a little bit of looking to, to find that. And so what I could do instead is store that, create a variable called river And I'm going to move this expression, this string, up here, store it in that variable, and then I will insert that variable for that where clause parameter. And then I've got a script that is a little easier to modify, have it run on something slightly different. And that's that's just a good practice. And uh, I have one more topic that I wanted to cover. I appreciate you folks uh, hanging on with me. I know it's, it's gone pretty long. And that is update cursors. So uh, to perform a, a bulk update, Create an update cursor using arcpy.da.update cursor instead of search cursor. But once again, you can use a for loop, or you should use a for loop to iterate through all the features in the cursor. But differently from using a search cursor, you're going to set instead of you know just reading values from fields, you're going to change the values that are held by the fields that you want to change. And then finally, you're going to use a method called update row to commit your changes. Until you do that, the changes actually won't, won't show up. And just as we saw with search cursors, you can apply a where clause to limit the features that you want to work with in your cursor. And just like with the search cursors, you're going to refer to the fields by their position in the tuple. Let's see an example. Here is uh, the boundaries feature class in that same geo database. And basically what I want to do in this example is uh, these are states. Uh, I want to set a region column in this attribute table to mid Atlantic for the states of Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. All right. So I set up a, an update cursor. Again, the syntax is pretty similar to search cursors. I supply a feature class, a fields tuple, what fields that I want to work with, and optionally a where clause. In this case, I am using a where clause, which I defined in this variable up here. And uh, I use the in operator to supply a list of the states that I was interested in. I could have also done state ABB equals US dash PA or state ABB equals US dash NY, et cetera but this in uh, syntax is a little slicker. So uh, I plug in that where clause, 
again, I'm going to give my cursor a name, uh, uh, the, the variable that holds my cursor a name. In this case, I'm just calling it cur, I think because I was running out of space on my slide. <laughs> and uh, then I, I iterate through the items in the cursor, the rows, and instead of just doing, you know, like print row zero in square brackets, like we were doing before, or, or taking that value and storing it in a variable, now I'm doing it kind of the other way around. I'm putting the row field number in square brackets for whatever field I want to update or change. I put that on the left hand side of an assignment statement. And over on the right hand side, I have the value that I want to set it to. And in this case, it's stored in this variable called region, which I set to mid Atlantic. Again, just having that won't actually commit the change to the table. You have to follow it up with this update row statement. So you do cur or cursor, depending on what you called your variable, dot update row. And then inside parentheses, you specify what row you want to update. And again, most examples, you'll see this, this variable here called row. But as I said earlier, you could call that record. You could call that, uh, in this case, you might call that state row. I don't know. So um, that's how update cursors operate. And if you were to actually try to run this code, uh, this note here says that you need to add that region field to the boundaries you selected for the work. And I just want to go through one last exercise uh, before we, we call it quits here. And that is to uh, write a script. So we've been dealing with that abbreviation field that, that starts with US dash, right? So create a new abbreviation field and update that field set its values to just that normal US abbreviation. Okay. And then I, I also have some slides on insert cursors. Uh, I'm not going to go over that today. Um, I'm running out of time here. So we'll just finish up with this exercise on update cursors because it, it does have importance to the project. Uh, I'll create a new script. And we oh, so I think I still had my path. I want to work with the boundaries feature class, so I'll copy that. All right. And Or I do this, this is the feature class. And I've, I just ran through this with a face-to-face -face class. I'm going to kill this field because it already has what I want to do. Um, so there's state ABB. I'm going to re-add that field that I just got rid of. And I have to remember how to do that. Table options. Yeah, add field. And I'm going to do PR. That's going to be text with a length of two. Okay. And by default, everything is null. And we're going to populate it now. So I'm going to have a variable called old field, which is I'm going to set to state ABB. And then I'll create one called new field. And the one I think I just named ABBR. And then I'll do my uh, set up my, my update cursor. Class, plug in my fields that I'm interested in, and I store those in variables, old field and new field. And 
And I want to do this for all the all of the uh, states in that boundaries feature class, so I don't have to use a, a where clause in this case. And I call this state cursor. And now I need to iterate through state cursor. And in this case, I'm going to call it state row, just to make sure you, you guys understand what change in the code and what needs to be locked in the set in stone. And so if I want to get the old, if I want to get the US dash, That value, and I'm going to want to lop off the US dash part, but I want to get that value first held in the state ABB column. How am I going to get that value in my code here? What should my next line be? Create a variable called old ABBR, old abbreviation. And what should I set that? Would it be old field index zero? Um, old old field is the, is the field in position zero in my tuple. Wait, so row index here. Almost. It's not row, it's state row in this case. Make sense? I decided to call this variable state row in this example. In previous examples, it was always row, right? But that's completely under your control. You can call that whatever you want. In this case, I called it state row. So in my code, at least, I have to refer to that row using that name. Okay, so that gives me the US dash version of the abbreviation. And as we've seen, lopping off the US dash part requires that syntax there. So I'm going to create a another variable called new ABBR that I use to store that slice of the, the old abbreviation. And now I want to take that value and stick it in that field, the ABBR field. So to do that, I would do state row. And what am I going to put inside the brackets? One? Right, because the, the new field is at position one in the tuple. And I'll set it equal to what? New ABBR. Yep, that's the two character abbreviation that I want to put into that field. Uh, but then again, I have to follow that up with an update row. Call to the update row method. And inside the parentheses, that, that method is expecting me to supply the row object that I want. slide example, I plugged in the variable row, but again, I call that variable state row in this case. So that's what I would plug in there. And there's a last step here that is a good idea to, to do, which I don't think I've shown in my slides, and that is to delete, uh, to get rid of the cursor.
All right, so I'll save this as update deviation.py. Run it. And there's nothing in my script that, you know, creates any output that I would see here in Python win. I'd have to come back here and I think I need to remove this layer and add it back in to see the change. Open the attribute table, and there we go. There's the ABBR field populated. Okay. So that's as far as I'm going to go today. You guys have listened to a lot, uh, absorbed a lot. Uh, I I also have uh, some slides on insert cursors, but um, I'll be, to be honest, that's not something that's used in the project, so I'm not going to focus on it here. Uh, but at this point, I'll take any questions anybody has. Any questions on the assignment, maybe, or anything else? Something small I noticed in the syntax of the search cursor earlier is that the SQL statement, even though in the syntax it needed to be at the end, it didn't look like you needed to put anything in between to skip over the other optional ones. Yeah, so um, getting back to the page in the help for the search cursor, Parameters are ordered such that the input table comes first, then the, the field names that you want, either a list or a couple, and then comes the where clause. So we only plugged in empty strings to set this SQL clause because in, in the examples that we were doing, we didn't care about this spatial reference parameter or the exposure points parameter. So we used the empty strings to skip over those parameters. I see. I just missed the where clause last time. Yeah, and, and yeah, I, I think there was an example in the slide where um, I wasn't using, I wasn't setting a where clause. So there were three sets of empty strings. But later on, I think I might have shown an example did set the where clause, so I only had two empty strings. So it, it depends on which parameters you want to skip. Any other questions? Well, I hope you found this helpful. And uh, Wish you the best of luck on your projects. Uh, it'll probably be a few hours before I can get the recording put up. Uh, I have to run back to the, the ice rink in just a few minutes, so I don't, I don't have time to wait for the recording to finish um, saving. But uh, if there's nothing else, we'll call it quits here, and uh, I'll be talking to you through email and the discussion forums. Thanks, Jim. Okay, thank you guys for taking your time out. I'll see you guys later.